Hello, my name is Anne Rose Kitagawa, and I'm the Chief Curator of Collections in Asian Art at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at the University of Oregon in Eugene. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our AAS Roundtable, Virtually United, Bringing Disparate Museum and Library Collections Together in Digital Exhibitions. Although university libraries and museums overlap in their core educational mission, differences in institutional history, philosophy, and protocols often result in incompatible data management, making it challenging to produce projects that integrate their collections. These difficulties can be exacerbated by the special material and linguistic needs of objects originating in Asia. From 2018 to 2020, the University of Oregon Libraries and the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art received a grant from the Mellon Foundation to enhance collaborative use of library and museum assets. Six professors received awards to produce research-driven digital projects combining library and museum resources. Three of those focus on Chinese or Japanese materials. This roundtable presents those East Asian projects as case studies of collaborative digital research and exhibition production. The three faculty members are joined by representatives from the libraries and the art museum to discuss technology platforms, the challenges of creating digital exhibitions of non-Western materials, and the pros and cons of a digital exhibition as a site for institutional collaboration. History professor Ina Asim's digital exhibition, The Artful Fabric of Collecting, uses Omeka and StoryMap.js to introduce art alongside documents and photographs focusing on Chinese textile collector and UO museum founder Gertrude Bess Warner. Art history professor Akiko Wally's Takagami and Kyogire, the University of Oregon's Japanese calligraphy collection, connects an album of Japanese calligraphic samples in the UO Library's special collections to sutra fragments in the Art Museum. She will discuss the potentials and limitations of Mirador as a platform for exhibiting heavily text-oriented non-Western materials. East Asian Languages and Literatures professor Glenn Wally's Yokai Senjafuda focuses on the UO's fabulous collection of Japanese woodblock printed votive slips, which is split between the library and the museum. He will discuss the process of uniting hundreds of separate slips in virtual space using Omeka. Franny Gady, head of Digital Scholarship Services, will present the perspective of the UO library staff, who coordinated and collaborated closely at every stage of these complicated Mellon faculty projects. She will discuss the organizational and technological challenges presented by this kind of collaboration and share the insights gained in overcoming them. I will discuss the project experience of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art and explain how we tried to coordinate the presentation of Asian materials from our collection with similar assets from the libraries. As one might expect, these projects required the dedicated participation of that proverbial village, the three faculty leads, plus a large team of library and museum staff. The list of those to whom acknowledgement is owed is far too long to recite, and thus, for details, I direct you to the individual credit pages for the digital exhibitions. But first, I'd like to give you a bit of background about the project. For many years, the UO Libraries and the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art collaborated on various projects. In 2016, we formed the UO Glam Alliance, a creative partnership motivated by shared interest in enriching the intellectual and cultural life on campus and in our community, leveraging our institutional resources, and improving visibility and advocacy for libraries and museums. In 2018, we were awarded a $300,000 grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to support enhanced collaboration and encourage increased use of university library and museum assets for teaching, learning, and research. The award funded a two-year program to issue Mellon grants to six UO faculty and to provide integrated library and museum staff support to help them develop and disseminate innovative curricular research projects that would increase the use of our collections and raise awareness of the vital role we play preserving cultural heritage and supporting research and pedagogy. The Mellon grant allowed us to hire three joint UO art museum positions a postdoctoral fellow to coordinate the faculty projects, plus two graduate student employees to assist. We publicized the grant opportunities and greenlighted six faculty proposals, three of which focus on Chinese and Japanese subjects. The University of Oregon's longstanding commitment to the study of East Asia is due in part to Asian art collector Gertrude Bess Warner who moved to Eugene in the 1920s and persuaded the university to establish an academic art museum to which she donated over 3,700 Chinese and Japanese works to found the institution now known as the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art. 
She also amassed 5,000 East Asian lantern slides and hundreds of books and manuscripts now housed in the UO libraries. Both institutions' wide-ranging agent collections include rare materials from the Warner uh, Legacy Collection and from the estate of anthropologist Frederick Starr. Our Mellon faculty projects presented various opportunities and challenges. One problem common to such intensive grant-supported initiatives is that in order to have enough time to conceptualize and produce their final projects, the faculty almost needed to know what their results would be before they had begun their research. Thus, fate favored those who were already familiar with tantalizing library and museum resources. The process of presenting assets from both collections and the same digital exhibitions required us to scrutinize how we catalog our holdings and try to find a middle ground between standard library and museum practices without undermining the representation of the same assets in our respective systems. Although the Mellon grants were designated I'm sorry, although the Mellon grants were designed to support one term of course release for each faculty recipient, it was challenging for them to complete their research and conceptualize and produce their final projects in such a short time. From the standpoint of the library and museum staff, who had no equivalent work releases, the same people had to juggle multiple simultaneous projects while maintaining their regular workloads. Compounding these factors, our university works on the quarter system, and given the requirement to finish three Mellon faculty projects by the end of each school year, it sometimes felt like running back-to-back -back marathons. Also, since the postdoc and the graduate students were employed only during the fall, winter, and spring, any Mellon issues that remained to be addressed over the summer became the responsibility of the library and museum, and due to unforeseen staff departures, we spent a certain amount of time searching for and hiring replacements. From the standpoint of the museum, the three Asian faculty projects each had their own benefits and challenges. Ina Asim's Artful Fabric of Collecting focuses on Gertrude Bass Warner's collection of over 450 Chinese textiles and related objects, which are diverse, fragile, and require careful handling. The perks of having such a large collection are counterbalanced by the energy and resources needed to maintain it. But it was wonderful that this project instigated a long overdue campaign of cataloging and photography. That being said, it was a lot of work to handle so many delicate light sensitive objects. I drove myself and others crazy producing long lists of textiles that would require significant staff time and effort to locate, transport, unpack, unfold, position, photograph, refold, repack, and put away. And I spent many hours studying and cataloging some of which could be done remotely using the terrific new high-resolution photos. Despite the obvious benefits of this renewed attention, the complicated logistics and the time it would have taken for the Mellon project team to upload each additional, additional object resulted in the inclusion of fewer textiles than we might have wished. By contrast, Akiko Wally's Takagami and Kyogire pro project was relatively simple from the museum standpoint because the 36 diminutive sutra fragments in our collection represent only a small portion of the total number of works considered and were already documented with photography. My responsibilities entailed data entry and the coordination of various uh, study visits for the graduate students and for a group of distinguished bestrolls from Japan. Akiko Wally's digital exhibition is a wonderful introduction to the culture of collecting Japanese calligraphy, and I'm sure that she will provide interesting details about the challenges she encountered trying to transcribe, transliterate, and translate traditional manuscripts. The museum's responsibility for Glenn Wally's Yokai Senjafuta project were likewise relatively straightforward, since the 1,750 Japanese printed votive slips in our care are relatively small, unmounted, and easy to handle. Nevertheless, though most had already been photographed, none were fully or consistently catalogued, their accession numbers were assigned in random order, and the collection contains many duplicates. So we, we identified and catalogued the relevant slips, only a few of which required new photography. The brilliance of Wally's digital exhibition is the fascinating background it provides about the production and culture of Senjafuda, along with the scholarly information about all those colorful Japanese monsters. My sense is that our UO colleagues, I'm sorry, that our library colleagues did the lion's share of the faculty support, since they directly oversaw the Mellon postdoc and graduate students and provided most of the technical expertise and project coordination needed to ensure that the digital exhibitions could be completed on time. I know that Franny Gady joins me in hoping that the final Mellon projects realize the faculty's visions.
From the standpoint of the museum, their digital exhibitions highlight their scholarly brilliance and the hard work, and we hope and hopefully will provide welcome new teaching and research opportunities. My colleagues and I are extremely happy and proud to have collaborated with them and with our counterparts in the UO libraries to produce specialized projects harnessing faculty expertise and creativity and to make available to a global audience unique and underutilized Asian resources from our collections. The ultimate rewards of our Mellon grant also include the establishment of precious long-term relationships, collaborative workflows, and infrastructure that inspire the libraries and Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art to continue collaborating in the future. With that, I'd like to pass the mic along to my dear colleagues and friends. Thank you. The Artful Fabric of Collecting is a digital exhibition that uses art, documents, and photographs from the collections of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art, JSMA, and Special Collections and University Archives, SCUA, at the University of Oregon, to retrace the process of museum founder Gertrude Bass Warner as she collected works of art to educate students and the public about Asian cultures. In this presentation, I will talk about the museum and the library to simplify. Focus of the digital exhibition are textiles from the Chinese collection of the museum and idealized images of sericulture in the collections of the museum and the library. Idealized images of sericulture and agriculture were collected by China's emperors. Once a reminder to the emperor of the importance of these activities as pillars for China's economy and for the welfare of the people, these images of a flourishing state became symbols of legitimate power. These images were also collected by Chinese scholars as art objects and by foreigners as exotic watercolor albums showing quintessential scenes from China. Together, these textiles, printed illustrations, and painted scenes of sericulture form just one pattern in the artful fabric of collecting. The website we pre created provides information about the collecting activities of Gertrude Bass Warner and includes contacts of persons who supported her collecting efforts, such as John Calvin Ferguson, Johann Wilhelm Norman Munte, among others. And it provides information about collecting silk textiles as works of art and presents selected pieces from the museum collection. Here you see Gertrude Bass Warner, the museum founder, and her contacts in China, John Calvin Ferguson and Johann Munte. The website provides information about the production process of silk and silk garments, including the basic weaves of Chinese silk and selected embroidery stitches, the art of Kassil tapestry weave, expressions of fashion in the decor of sleeve bands, colors, and decorative roundels, details of a theater robe, and examples of Manju ceremonial attire. Here you see a Taoist robe of which the museum owns three. It's a Taoist priest's robe with four clawed dragon roundel design. And we show you a detail, detail on the right side from the left shoulder part of this robe which shows you that with the high resolution imagery that is included in the website, you can zoom into details at a very high resolution and with visibility, high visibility of minute details. The website provides pictures of tilling and weaving Gunjutu, in a variety of media from the museum and library collections. Included are two woodblock print albums, a set of ink cakes, an album of watercolors, and to show how this program of pictures of tilling and weaving spread through East Asia and enjoyed uh, appreciation as art, an eight panel folding screen from Korea and 12 woodblock prints by Kitagawa Utamaro, as well as lantern slides showing scenes of tilling and weaving from Warner's travels in Asia. Here you see the cover of one of the two albums, one illustration of the second album, 
one of the ink cakes and one album leaf from the watercolor album of sericulture. And two panels of the Korean folding screen, which shows you that in the screen, the pictures of agriculture and sericulture are combined. Agriculture is shown at the top and the scenes of sericulture show up in the center of the folding screen. And finally, one album leaf from the Utamaro series. The website provides also a bilingual illustrated glossary with garment types, embroidery stitches and weaves, and a four-part bibliography addressing the topics of collecting as passion and profession, silk, its history, products and trade, garments, designs and patterns, textile technology, conservation and terminology, and finally, sericulture, silk industry and silk production. Here you see two illustrations of the glossary. The digital exhibition was created in Omeka S and includes story maps. Omeka S is a next generation web publishing platform for institutions interested in connecting digital cultural heritage collections with other resources online. ArcGIS Story Maps helps to tell digital stories with custom maps. On the Omeka S site directory, you will find our project listed under the Artful Fabric of Collecting. Under credits, you see how many people were active and engaged in setting up the site. And finally, you see listed the modules and vocabularies used to support this site on Omega S. Modules are just as vocabularies hidden from the user's view. Omega S has 55 modules. 21 of these were used for the Artful Fabric of Collecting and make the site searchable, relatable, and allow for a collection of site use metrics that reveal the profile of the site to the specialist librarian. It's so to speak the secret life of the site, which remains hidden from the general viewer. Omeka S vocabularies are part of the resource section for global data description and are also hidden from the user's view. Vocabularies describe items, item sets, and media. Omeka S provides, by default, three metadata vocabularies, and the Artful Fabric site is linked to eight additional metadata vocabularies that the programmers, the specialist librarians, included. Hello, and thank you for visiting our panel. My Mellon project involves two sets of calligraphy collection at the University of Oregon. One is a tekagami or mirror of hands in the special collections and university archives or SCUA. And the other is a set of 36 fragments of calligraphy at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art or JSMA. A tekagami is an accordion style album of old calligraphy fragments or koshitsugire the Skua Tekagami holds a total of 319 fragments. The album was most likely compiled around mid 19th century, but the fragments range in date from 8th to 17th century. This album was a part of Gertrude Baswana's gift to the university. The Skua Tekagami exudes incredible presence and tactility. The front, and back covers are lined with delicate silk. And the four corners are adorned with metal fittings with a floral motif done in silver inlay. The sense of tactility continues inside for many of the fragments come with lush paper decoration. On the square poetry card to the right, for instance, the fluid calligraphy floats across the page that is dyed in red and further embellished with an image of wisteria in mist done in gold and silver. 
The school of Tekagami includes varying types of texts from Buddhist scriptures, single poems on oblong or square decorative paper, pages from poetry anthologies and narrative stories, to other private and official documents such as letters and diary. The JSMA collection, on the other hand, is a set of 36 individually mounted fragments of Buddhist scriptures known as Kyogire, dating again from 8th to 17th century. The handwriting on the accompanying oblong slips reveals that the set was purchased from an antique store in Kyoto called Geirinso. The JSMA set represents an exceptional breadth in calligraphy style and quality and types of ornamentations from lush use of gold and silver to painted underdrawings and stamped motif. It includes examples from Korea and possibly China and every major period of calligraphy, history of calligraphy in Japan from the Nara to Edo period. This balanced diversity within the same genre of calligraphy makes this set intriguing and invaluable, particularly as a pedagogical tool. My Melon project identified and transcribed all 319 plus 36 fragments and positions them, positioned them in the context of the history of Japanese calligraphy and calligraphy collecting. The fruit of this year long research resulted in a digital exhibition Tekagami and Kyogire, the University of Oregon Japanese Calligraphy Collection. The exhibition also makes available the preliminary metadata for each of the fragments, including transcriptions of content and for some transliterations and translations and high resolution images. In the future, the metadata will be made fully bilingual for a more global access. For the Tekagami side, our hope was to use Mirador to present the entire album two page spread at a time to showcase the interplay between the fragments on a page while simultaneously making the inf information for individual fragments accessible by clicking on the image. Unfortunately, the version of Mirador available at the time of the project could not accommodate the standard right to left movement of an East Asian manuscript. We are presently working to customize Mirador, but in the meantime, we approximated this effect using the universal viewer, hyperlinking the metadata for individual fragments to those of the two page spread pages. The Mellon Fellowship gave me the opportunity to create a foundation for a multi-year transdisciplinary and collaborative research. Presently, I am continuing my research on the school of Tekagami as a Getty scholar. The fruit of this uh, research will be made accessible on the digital exhibition. The experience of creating an online database allowed me to reflect on effective digital data sharing and on the types of data that are truly useful for scholars and students worldwide. For instance, during my Mellon term, I chose to collect initial data in a Word document because of its higher versatility in working in Japanese. However, to communicate the data to the digital team, I converted the information on Word master document in on it, into an Excel spreadsheet, which was then cut and pasted into the Omeka S item field. The three step process was necessary due to the sheer number of fragments and volume of information. But because Word, Excel and Omeka S are not fully compatible with each other, certain functions such as highlights or font colors sometimes did not transfer automatically between words, Word and Excel, or they require an additional HTML coding to achieve in Omeka S. Furthermore, because it was beyond my ability to override some default settings of Omeka S, not all information I envisioned appearing together actually appeared together in the final product. These hiccups and limitations promoted, uh, pr uh, prompted me to not only prioritize the information, 
but also to think more deeply about whether or not certain methods of organization that I took for granted, such as color coding, are in fact the most effective or accessible ways of conveying a content in digital communication. This project is still very much a work in progress. The Mellon website has the potential to present a more universally accessible database for the study of Japanese calligraphy and to provide a venue for an ongoing collaborative scholarship. Looking ahead, establishing a consensus on the most useful content and effective presentation of data set and envisioning what a transdisciplinary and global database of fragmented Japanese calligraphy could look like are foundational steps toward achieving such aspirations. Thank you, and I look forward to our discussion. First, I'd like to briefly explain my project before reflecting on some of the issues I faced with it. The title of my digital exhibition, Yokai Senjifuda, consists of two Japanese terms that haven't been naturalized into English, although one is on the verge. My goal was to introduce these two unfamiliar or semi-familiar concepts, using each to illuminate the other. Senjifuda, or nozatsu, often called votive slips in English, began in the 18th century as small pieces of paper bearing a worshiper's name The said worshiper would paste on a wall, gate, or other surface at a temple or shrine. This practice, still survives today and votive slips can still be commonly found pasted in such places. Slips for pasting are generally simple monochromatic affairs, but the slips that my melon site focuses on are in fact full color woodblock prints that can be thought of as miniature ukiyo-e. These belong to a distinct but related dimension of senjifuda practice. Within a few decades after their emergence, senjifuda evolved into items for exchanging and collecting. Slips of this latter type came to sport elaborate full color designs. Most of the little scholarly attention paid to Senjifuda has focused on the religious, cultural, and social networking aspects of pasting and collecting culture. As well it might, pasting slips were and are intriguing artifacts of a semi-renegade religious practice enacted privately in a public space. Exchange slips, while less overtly transgressive, nonetheless occupy a subcultural space whose cultish appeal is assiduously cultivated by participants. But exchange slips in particular can also be appreciated purely on a visual level. They can boast incredibly fine craftsmanship, brilliant design sense, and a dizzying variety of motifs. The University of Oregon has one of the largest collections of Senjifuda in the world. It contains over 100 scrapbooks filled with slips, stacks of unmounted slips, and tools, publications, and ephemera relating to Senjifuda, Senjifuda practice dating from the 1840s or so to the 1990s. We're talking a total of several thousand individual images. Some of these had been digitized before I began my project, more were digitized during the project, and more, over half, still await digitization. The Yokai Senjifuda exhibition was meant to highlight this collection by showcasing and analyzing a number of examples united around a single theme. We chose Yokai, traditional Japanese ghosts and monsters. As many of you will know, Yokai are becoming increasingly known in the West through their prominence in manga and anime culture. I teach yokai related texts in several classes myself, and since the Senjifuda collection includes many examples, it seemed a perfect match. In the end, we identified over 300 slips with the yokai connection, and these are accessible on the site in high resolution digital formats. Most of them are worked into the site's narrative, meaning they play some role in exploring either Senjifuda culture, yokai culture, or both, and receive some level of analysis and commentary. I ended up writing over 30,000 words for the site. I'd like to now briefly address three issues I faced in this project. The first is what you see in the description of this round table, the process of uniting hundreds of disparate items in virtual space using Omeka. To be honest though, as I was putting this presentation together, I realized that this was, from my perspective, the easy part. I found Omeka fairly smooth to use. That being said, I got good training on it from support staff, and more importantly, they did a whole lot of behind the scenes stuff in terms of assembling and importing the images and designing the basic architecture of the site. Essentially, I just copied and pasted in my writing and dragged and dropped images where I wanted them to appear. As a result, I wouldn't say I understand how to use Omeka per se. I learned how to do what I needed to do for my part, but relied on others for the rest. Maybe the lesson here is have excellent support and guidance. Easier said than done, but not in this case. 
However, I did face an issue, and ultimately I think a failure in connection with these hundreds of disparate items. My initial hope was that in the process of putting my site together, I'd generate a whole lot of new metadata. That is, I was hoping that for each of the slips we included, I could translate all text appearing on the slip, as well as adding a paragraph or so explaining the artistic motif. This information would be added to the metadata for each slip so that when it was accessed on its own, out of the context of my exhibition, say through Oregon Digital, where the UO Library's photo slips are digitized, or through the JSMA's website, all this information would be available. This didn't happen, partly because of time, but mainly because I couldn't stop thinking like a writer of articles or monographs. What I set out to do is at least partly a database project with the narrative overlaid on the top in the form of the text of the site and its organizational scheme, but soon the narrative came to consume all my focus and I ended up neglecting the database project. As I say, part of this was about time. With a finite amount of time to work on the project and knowing that the narrative part of the site was what most people would see, at least initially, I ended up prioritizing that and then didn't have time to flesh out the database aspects. But I think a bigger issue and the one that I'd, I'd like to highlight here for any scholar who's contemplating this kind of project is that I couldn't make the right mental adjustment. I just couldn't find a way to approach the material that wasn't essentially writing a book. I ended up concentrating on crafting my text into a quasi-narrative, quasi-argument presentation that worked the images into the points I was trying to make. And inevitably, some of the 300 or so we initially identified ended up not being necessary to my argument, and so I ended up not discussing them. And once I'd finished the narrative text, I felt like I had made my point, even though I wasn't finished in terms of my initial design. And so the fleshed out metadata just didn't happen. This tendency, to think in terms of narrative also affected the way I ended up organizing the site. I wanted readers to be able to experience the material in a more or less orderly way that added up hopefully to an argument or at least a story, which meant that it had to be read more or less in sequence. You read this page after reading that one for full effect. And I believe it's successful on that level, but that makes it less successful as a database because the various pages on which you can find information about the images aren't self-contained in terms of what they say, and in some cases can't be accessed without following the narrative through a few links. There's certainly cross-linking and multiple entry points, but overall as a user, and I use this site in my teaching quite a bit, it doesn't feel wholly digital age to me. In short, I feel the biggest challenge I faced was learning to think about the material in a way that would have made best use of the potential of the medium. If I had to do it over, I'd think more about that from the outset. Hello, I'm calling these brief prepared remarks, creation, collaboration, celebration, supporting collections-based research through digital scholarship projects. And over the next few minutes, I'd like to talk about my and the University of Oregon Library's role in bringing the projects you've heard about to fruition. A face for the disembodied voice you're hearing. My name is Franny Gady, and I am the Director of Digital Scholarship Services at the University of Oregon Libraries. A brief note of thanks. First, to the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, without whom none of this would be possible. Their continued support has enabled a truly enormous amount of work on this grant. The staff of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art, the staff of the University of Oregon Libraries, including my amazing colleagues in Digital Scholarship Services, Application Design and Integration, Collection Services, Data Services, Administrative Services, and Research and Instructional Services, our Mellon Postdoctoral Fellows, Jenny Krieger and Ben Gillespie, both of whom have gone on to have amazing careers, our Mellon graduate employees, Liam Mayer, Tom Fisher, and Aksa Khan, and our original PIs, Adrian Lim and Jill Hartz, who've both departed the project, but whose vision set us down this road and helped us build these strong relationships. And last, but certainly not least, our amazing faculty who created these amazing projects. I have the word digital prominently in my title, and I love talking about technology and tools, platforms, products. It's the part that brings people in. In many ways, it lowers the barrier to entry to scholarship and research that's otherwise out of reach. 
whether it's in a scholarly journal or a monograph. It helps make it accessible, attractive, and interactive. And while I'm definitely going to talk about technology, because it's a major part of our output, how we brought our collections together, how this research was shared, the technology is just the tiniest bit of the iceberg, really. It's all about the people. The individuals who worked on these projects are identified on each website, giving credit where credit is due. And it's one of the most important things that we do. And for every single project, there were one or more people dedicated to each of these roles that's listed on this slide. Performing original research, our faculty who've presented for you today, our postdoctoral scholars and graduate employees who supported them and conducted supplementary research, our postdoctoral scholars and members of library staff who provided project management, while designers and developers at the libraries offered technology support, staff at both the libraries and JSMA created hundreds of new digital images and coordinated metadata creation and crosswalking to allow entry into our exhibit platform and contribution back to our respective digital asset management systems. Our postdoctoral scholars, graduate employees, library and museum staff, and faculty all helped build these projects and then checked to make sure they were as perfect as we could make them. And then after they were released into the world, made sure they had all the appropriate security updates, were on the most stable version of the platform, and then didn't experience any downtime given their presence on shared servers with other library websites. It takes an absolute village. And while some of these roles are technical in nature, many of them are not and require areas of expertise in non-technical fields. And then the last thing I wanted to highlight is that many of these roles and responsibilities persist past the immediate planning and build of the project. When we take on a project like this, it's a long-term commitment, though not an eternal one. Technical projects have a limited lifespan, though we do make every effort to ensure that both the intellectual labor and the digital objects are made as permanent as possible. The three projects highlighted here are all on the Omeka S platform, which is a newer addition to the pantheon of content management systems used in digital humanities projects. Some of you may have worked with Omeka before or are familiar with Omeka Classic, which is still widely used. We were interested in working with Omeka S for a number of reasons. First, it would allow us to have a shared object pool from which we could draw for multiple exhibits while only entering the metadata for those objects once. Second, it has what's called multi-site capability. So one installation, multiple independent sites associated with it. WordPress is probably the most popular multi-site content management system that people are familiar with, and Omeka S makes it much easier for us to create new Omeka sites for our faculty and gives us the opportunity to change up things like metadata schemas, themes, plugins, that kind of thing. We didn't necessarily want or need to do that for this particular set of projects, but it was a tool that we wanted to adopt in the long term for digital humanities projects on the University of Oregon campus. And then finally, the S in Omeka S stands for semantic, and it would allow us to take advantage of the linked data work that the libraries have been doing with our Oregon Digital Cultural Heritage Repository platform at some point in the future. So again, these are long-term goals, but this was something that we did with exciting possibilities for the future and that aligned with our existing platforms. I wanted to talk about a few considerations for Asian collections and exhibits that we encountered on Omeka S that weren't specific to any one project. First, support for top to bottom and right to left script varies depending on where you are in the site. Some text areas and plugins supported it fine, while others really didn't work at all. Depending on what you're trying to do, your mileage may vary. Along those lines, but more of a design quirk and less about functionality, but the default font for the themes that we were using did not handle mixed script text well. 
if we tried to use kanji and Latin characters on a given line, the spacing for the lines would be thrown off. And finally, there isn't plugin support for multilingual sites. If you want a Korean English site, you're going to be doing double the work at the moment. But this is also one of the reasons we were interested in working with Omeka S. It's an opportunity to do some work on the cutting edge and to help push development in the directions that we wanted it to go. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you here today. And we're going to transition into our group discussion now and look forward to hearing your questions later on. Thank you. So I'd like to open the roundtable by throwing a question out to everyone in the group. Uh, the question is, what were the pros and cons of the cross-institutional cross collaboration and cross-institutional technologies? Who would like to start? Well, maybe you. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, so uh, hello, um, Akiko Wali. Uh, I do uh, Japanese art history. Uh, so for me, because my project was um, uh, uh, involved almost like two stages of the same continuum in terms of the collecting of calligraphy, uh, the digital collaboration worked really, really well because in physical space, the only way to sort of make that point was to physically move one object to the other institution. But now that they are together on the digital exhibition, the people who visit the exhibition will be able to sort of see them side by side and understand that one, you know, the fragments that is in the museum can be a stage that is moving towards Tekagami and have the Tekagami be the final project. And at the same time, I was able to all, uh, I was also able to bring in a uh, uh, hanging scroll that had that sort of calligraphy fragment and to show that there was another way to mount. And all of that is very easy to do because of it's a digital space. I, I could just Brandy add Katie oh, as a library. So sorry, Andrew Gross, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. I just wanted to say that kind of that, that things that you can do in digital space that you can't do in physical space is one of the things that's the most exciting to me, right? It, it makes the impossible possible and I think more accessible in a way that's really exciting to me. And I think the other thing um, that I think maybe applies a little bit more to Akiko's project than to Ina and Glenn's project is that, you know, we were working on this during the pandemic as well. And so working in this digital space literally made work possible that uh, wasn't otherwise um, possible. Uh, given that we were all working remotely. So that that, that was really um, vital as well. And then finally, I think, you know, working in this cross-institutional fashion as somebody who was fairly new to the libraries um, at the time that this project started, um, I was, I really felt like I was able to kind of embed myself in the institution, um, you know, in a way and, and build these relationships that I think have been so important um, to kind of find a home and a place and um, to, you know, just meet all of these amazing folks at the University of Oregon who've really helped me feel both kind of at home intellectually and, you know, socially as well as we're, as we've been working on these projects. Again, so uh, in addition to what Franny said about the pandemic, um, I think we're all finding in these COVID-19 days that um, technologies are, you know, a mixed bag. Um, working in an art museum, obviously art is primary and it's very frustrating not to be able to get to the original objects. However, um, in the case of the three projects we're discussing today, um, Ina Asim's project included textiles of all different shapes and sizes that are very fragile and would be impossible to show to students all at one time. Um, and uh, Kiko Wally and Glenn Wally's projects um, encompassed very, very small items that even if you could put them in front of a student, or class, only one student could see them at a time and not very well. And digital technology allows them to be globally accessible in ways that go on in perpetuity. And that's going to raise the level of scholarship about these things. So um, that's perhaps the only upshot of the weird days in which we live. I also think the the points that you made about accessibility for any that were key to me because now the viewer really doesn't need to know in which section of this institution or in 
which part of the two institutions, the museum or the library, these resources are housed because they are all connected. I have to say, I could not have done this during the pandemic. I'm glad that we did it before because I needed to work with a lot of archival material that I would not have had access to. Now that the project is accessible, I can actually assign it to my students to look something up. In fact, I did today, one of my students asked me about uh, some bibliographical hints. And so I gave him some hints from the library website, but then also added the, the GLAM project. So this uh, will potentially help. Um, I'll jump in and say, you know, I, I found that what everybody else is saying about um, their projects was true of mine as well. In my case, the cross-institutional collaboration was, um, I guess, the cornerstone of the whole thing because the Senja Fuda collection at UO is, is bifurcated between the two institutions based on whether they're bound into albums or are loose. Um, and so I, you know, I always show both sets to students, but I can never show them in the same room, right? Um, I always have to, you know, go to the library on this day and look at some of them, we'll look at others at the museum. Being able to put them next to each other in, in virtual space was just absolutely essential to what I was doing. And the best example of that is this um, image on the front page of my site, which is this 18 panel sequence, where it turned out that one of the key panels was in the museum, while the rest were in the library. And so I could never have put this whole thing, this puzzle together, literally, it could not have been done without the digital space and like the, the collaboration. So, um, so um, that. yeah, and I, I would like to add though that, um, you know, one, I, I suppose uh, a danger of these digital collaboration is uh, a, a person might feel that it's no longer necessary to look at the original, but that is not really the case. Um, for my project, I, uh, the digital exhibition, I hope, uh, will be an incentive for people to come to Yovo and see the pieces, you know, once everything opens up. And like Ina, I would not have done, be able to do this without my access to the original objects. And um, speaking of pandemic, I remember um, I was frantically measuring the fragments the day before the library was scheduled to be shut down. So, you know, the mad dash of, you know, getting everything done. So, so the object is, you know, we would not be doing this if we did not love the actual pieces and if we did not want to introduce the actual pieces. So um, digital exhibition allows us to um, widely circulate and publicize, not publicize, but, um, let everybody know that we have these beautiful things and interesting things so that people can come and see them in person. Yeah, I think it's important what you're saying because when I think about the textiles, it is fabulous that we have high resolution photography and when I assign something to a student or one of the my colleagues from art history just contacted me and told me that she used the, the site it's fabulous to really be able to zoom in and see great details. But as you said, this doesn't keep you from going to the, to the object itself because you don't get a feeling for the scale. So once the students see a dragon robe in its original size, after they have studied the details, after they have, they know how to read this garment, when they then see the, the, the robe itself, they get an idea of what it actually looks like once it's fully unfolded and how impressive it is when the light falls onto the embroidery, how it shimmers and what this kind of garment represents in a ritual or represented when it was uh, in use in the palace. So it's really important that the digital is a good memory. It's a good archival tool. It's a good detail um, oriented tool that you can't offer to the students when you take them with a class into the museum. But uh, it's both 
complement each other. We have to have the digital version, we have to have the museum um, display. And the same is true also for the documents in the library. I think um, in my project, I could only include a few letters from the time period and you can see them on the site and you can zoom in and see the handwriting, but uh, by far not all of these letters that constitute the uh, co correspondence of Gertrude Bass Warner, for instance, can be captured by this project. So I hope this is an incentive for a lot of people who are interested in collecting, interested in this time period, at the transition from Imperial to the Republic of China, Imperial times to the Republic of China, that they actually look at um, the collected letters in the library. Thinking also about just the technologies as well, um, it's it's a little bit of a chicken and an egg issue as well that you know some for some of these projects the the platform was kind of chosen before the project was, <laughs> um, and sort of is forcing a square peg to fit into a round hole, and also Omeka S is relatively early in its lifespan as a content management system, and so we were doing a lot of innovating as we were you know building the plane as we were flying it. And apologies for like three terrible metaphors in a row here. But, um, you know, we, we were doing a lot of, um, you know, work as the, as the research was being done as well. And so, you know, I think in a lot of cases, um, it, the, the end product doesn't always match what the initial vision was. And, um, and also like the, the displays and the, um, you know, the feature sets and the interactivity isn't always where we wanted it to be when we started out too. And so, um, I think the other piece is also what we want to preserve in the long term, and you know the the added layers of complexity um, with interactivity, with annotation, with these high levels of zoom and these high resolution images, add addition le additional levels of complexity when it comes to preserving the you know this scholarship, right? And so it, it's relatively simple to preserve paper. It's relatively simple to preserve text files. It's relatively simple to preserve PDFs, we think. But when we start getting into more interactive websites, uh, it's it's a, a bigger question mark. You know, we have some best practices and we're going to do our very best to, to preserve them for as long as we can and to, you know, migrate them to new platforms as we're able. But, um, you know, for, for the amount of intellectual labor on the part of the enormous project teams, uh, it's it's a difficult proposition to think about what the lifespan of, of a project like this might be. Franny had also made the point about the technology not necessarily being ideal for a given project, but you know, as a technophobic Asianist, um, I'm constantly looking at things and grouchily complaining about how it, well, that's not going to work for my material. So how do you wake, make it work for your material? You actually work with it and explain to the company why they need to update things so that it accommodates foreign character sets and from left to right and top to bottom. Um, so I feel like that's good service that everyone put in in order to make it a more global platform. Can I jump in and suggest that maybe, I, I know that, Ina, you struggled with this right to left reading issue. I wonder if you'd like to say a little bit about that. And I know that's actually an issue for Akiko and, and me as well in different ways. That might be a thing to think about. I actually honestly didn't have to struggle that much with it because mm -hmm. even though maybe you, you are alluding to the fact that the website currently says the Chinese version of my site is under construction, that's not due to technical difficulties really right at the at this moment um the the site actually has been constructed and uh, there was no question of readability from right to left so the directions are not a problem it will be it will take a little bit of work just to match the text text with the inserts of graphics and uh, photographs at the right side, uh, right position. So I didn't have as many difficulties as you had, 
potentially with the the script systems. What I I got a question from Akiko um, previously. She asked me whether I had any training. I had a training with the staff of the Digital Scholar Center in Omeka Est, but it would be a um, really pompous exaggeration to say that I'm fit, especially now that it took some time, some time has passed, and I don't use Omeka S every day. I had a little bit more experience with Omeka, the, the previous version of the program, and I learned when we switched to Omeka S that it is much more um, versatile, much more powerful in a, a certain way because it can handle very different data sets and also allow for the metadata uh, collection to be much more, um, much larger. But when it came to the graphic design of the, the page itself, we were actually tied to a rhythm between text and image, whereas in the, the previous version or in, you know, uh, content management uh, uh, projects like or programs like WordPress, you have the the possibility to nicely let the the text flow around the image, and the more data you have to add or that are actually stored in the background that make the site readable and relatable behind everything that the viewer sees, the more. I had the feeling, and Franny is, of course, much better, the much better person to ask here, you are confined more on the surface and how you design that to allow for the embedding of not only one image, but once you click on this image to have a series of images and to have these images zo uh, zoomable and sort of to have relatable structures behind the surface. So I, it was a steep learning curve for me, for sure. Yeah, so um, in my case, yeah, right to left movement was very important. And um, because of the material, it was possible to make it an important aspect, but um, I, I wanted to make a point that this um, album had a particular sequence and the sequencing was just as important as individual fragments. So in order to convey that, there had to be the movement of right to left had to be somehow uh, replicated. And Mirador at the time did not have the capability to go right to left. And I've seen a version very recently in a Japanese website that had that orientation. So now I think it has that capability. And in fact, uh, uh, Franny and I are working with um, Azel uh, and the team to sort of uh, uh, customize so that we can update the website with, uh, 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 you know, better, not better, but uh, more apt um, Mirador. But we tried a couple of um, workarounds. One was to create a flip book so that we are actually flipping the album like one would do. And that was fantastic. But the, um, the shortcoming was that the flip book was just a flip book and you couldn't link the information to each of the fragment um, metadata through the flip book. So that was a little bit um, not quite what I was envisioning to create that connection between the whole and the fragments. So what we ended up doing was to just use the simple universal viewer and have the two page spread be uh, coming up page by page and you can click on them and link the information to individual fragments in the more information section. So, um, but the bigger issue is what Rose mentioned about trying to sort of, you know, technology can always be better, I think. And, you know, it's a work, like a, a work in progress. Um, so, um, you know, to figure out a creative way to at least simulate what 
you have envisioned the website to do is important. And it also, um, I mentioned a little bit in my presentation, but it also made me think about what digital communication is and what is the effective way to communicate digitally. Uh, that is actually a different kind of communication um, from in person or even, you know, uh, publishing an article. Um, so, um, yeah, so I, I think it was kind of a, an interesting creative ac activity, I think. And, you know, that's one of the interesting things about working with Omeka, particularly, which has been developed for cultural heritage institutions like libraries and museums to work with. And so it's using um, platforms like Mirador and Universal Viewer and adapting them as plugins to display high resolution images. Um, so they're taking these pre-existing platforms like Mirador and Universal Viewer that have these suite of um, functions that we'd like to bring into Omeka, um, but the Omeka versions of these platforms Aren't, don't necessarily have feature parity, right? So things that we've seen in other places, we can't necessarily bring into Omeka just yet. And so that's one of the things that we're really interested in doing. And, and I think is absolutely the ultimate goal. And Akiko has been incredibly you know, creative and thoughtful as, as she's you know, used a variety of different feature sets and has also used you know, still images and, and, you know, just bringing in different ways of looking at this content to, to get your message across. And so I think, it, you know, again, as we, as we were saying, you know, part of, part of the issue of the technology is, you know, sometimes it's just not where you want it. And so, you know, we've taken a number of different approaches from, you know, developing plugins and themes ourselves where we've been able to, but, you know, with projects like like this, we had staff departures throughout the entire project. Um, you know, we contracted with outside developers to assist us with this. Um, but then you're also encountering, you know, going back and forth, trying to get the feature sets you want. Sometimes you're encountering different time zones. Sometimes, it, you know, you're not quite communicating what it is that you're looking for and are operating on extremely condensed timelines. So, you know, when, when we're working on projects like this, um, you know, I think being both flexible and creative is incredibly important. So I'm um, leaping off of what Franny just said. I, I wanted to talk not just about sort of the, the myopic nature of technologies, but also we, ha we have to change some of our internal systems. I think anybody who deals with non-Western art in a primarily Western context is constantly having to explain that my recto is your verso and your last name is my um, family name and and those are things that I you know sort of fight those battles within my own institution and and it's good just to make everyone more aware that there's more than one way to go about these um, thinking about these systems. So that sort of um, connects to one of the questions I received about the long-term plan of my project. Um, the, the, the Mellon dis Digital Exhibition I created, I created to be a platform to jump off to a long-term um, project. And my ambitious, <laughs> rather ambitious goal is to create some sort of um, universal database um, so that uh, it is at least bilingual and scholars from Japan, st scholars and students from Japan, but also from worldwide will be able to access and connect so that um, uh, information about calligraphy and calligraphy collecting is shared. And I, I believe this is important because um, outside of Japan, calligraphy is not as widely studied and not as widely uh, popular as, as an art form. Oh, and it is part in China. Of it for Japan, well, I, I mean, what I, what I mean is outside of the uh, East, Asia. Uh, East Asia, the place that people uh, speak the language basically, <laughs> right? And, you know, the idea is that it's not, the linguistic ability can help, but it's not necessarily the only thing that is needed to study calligraphy, but because of that uh, barrier, um, I, 
I, I feel that it is not as um, widely um, popularly uh, uh, recognized. And uh, uh, a website like this and sort of a universal database might be a way to sort of um, uh, at least recti rectify that a little bit um, and to show that, you know, calligraphy is beautiful and it's something that is beyond just reading. So um, in uh, 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 to sort of on the process in on the way to that, um, I have been continuing to collaborate with the four scholars from Japan who visited us to look at survey the um, University of Oregon's collection of calligraphy. And um, I've started uh, a, a communication with other scholars working on this material to sort of discuss what is the ideal format for that sort of um, uh, 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 database. So that's kind of an um, exciting development. So speaking of ideal formats, Glenn, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about like knowing if you knew then what you know now about your project and your site and your materials, would, would you have organized your exhibit differently? Uh, I would have organized my time differently, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I have been able to watch Akiko up close to see how she has approached her project. And I'm going to embarrass her, but I'll just say that she started from making this really meticulous set of records for each one of these different slips and translating it, transcribing it, getting all the information together before she started saying anything about them. And in retrospect, that's what I would have tried to do. Mm. That's what, kind of what I was gesturing at in my presentation by talking about this metadata issue. I, I wanted also to end up with this database where people could look at any image, look at the metadata on it and find a complete description of what's going on in there. Uh, transcriptions, for example, of all the names of the collectors and uh, sponsors who are responsible for these slips. Um, so I would have started with that if I had realized that I wouldn't get to it if I put it off to the end. As far as the organization, um, I probably, I'm, I might have decided that I needed more of a table of contents page. Mm. Um, the way it's, I, I think the way the design we kind of settled on Jenny and I is kind of like this this almost like a Venn diagram, mm -hmm. sort of like there's this, this course you can take through the material that starts with Senjafuda as your topic, what are Senjafuda and leads you through that. And there's several cross links over to the other path, but the other path is you can start with what are yokai and lead through a discussion of that. And they talk to each other, but I've found that like, I know what page I'm looking for, but I have to follow five or six links to get to there mm -hmm. rather than having a simple like upfront, this is every like sitemap sort of thing. and you can get that, but I, because this is what I was talking about in the presentation, because I was thinking so linearly, um, I thought, oh, that's not a problem. I want people to read this stuff first before they get to this later part. But now using it as a teacher, I'm like, well, I just want them to cut to this particular page. So <laughs> that might be the answer to that. I'd like to defend you from yourself in the sense that I think it is unrealistic for you to try and catalog the um, tens of thousands of Senjafuda at the University of Oregon. Even just whittling down which ones were appropriate for your project was a monumental task. So. Well, um, actually, I, I should I need to give a shout out to the, the students that we hired for that because they did the winnowing. And I, I expected that I would have to follow over them every step of the way, but they were totally able to figure out, okay, this is relevant, this is not, and so that work was done for me. But I do want to step back and say, actually, you know, this, I was never going to try to do 10,000 of these, but I really did have in mind from the start that metadata for each one of the ones, at least that have to do with yokai, was the goal, and like this, the scholarly discussion of it was just a means to the end. So, I mean, that was the way I pitched it from the start, that, that's what didn't quite work. I would still argue that the scholarly presentation that you did of it oh, is I'm amazing and so incredibly valuable. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. And I, I do find, you know, as from a digital humanities perspective, that the metadata is equally valuable, but that the scholarly presentation is as well. And so I, you know, I don't think that one can necessarily be valued 
over the other. And so, you know, I, I, I don't think it's a, it's an either or proposition. I, I think both are incredibly valuable. Ideally, yeah, ideally you have. Yep. So, um, you know, how, however it ended up, I, I think, uh, <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. Um, so, you know, bringing up the graduate students for a moment there, I had a question about how they were trained. Um, and, you know, our graduate students uh, took on a variety of tasks. Um, and so they were trained in a bunch of different, um, a dif different technologies. So they worked in uh, WordPress and Omeka S. Um, they also worked with all of the different viewers that we used from Mirador to Universal Viewer. We also used the Internet Archives Book Viewer in a number of cases um, and also used that to uh, reverse so that we could do some of that um, right to left uh, book viewing as well. And that was really important. Um, and most of that training was taken on by our postdoctoral fellows. So. Um, you know, our, our graduate employees and our postdoctoral fellows, they are our future, and I am very excited that they are in good hands, that our future is in such good hands. So uh, speaking of the future, I think uh, Anne Rose wanted us to talk a little bit about that. So do you want to get us started there? One question that had come up was a little bit about the past, and um, the only thing that I'd like to say about previous um, collaborations between the UO Libraries and the George Schnitzer Museum of Art is that there have been many over many years. Um, they run the gamut from shared archives, shared collections, loans. We've been very fortunate to receive many loans for exhibitions and for teaching um, and overarching projects. The Senja Fuda project that Glenn Wally is working on is a small piece of an enormous amount of work that is going on with what is likely to be one of the world's largest collection of such materials. And so um, I think from my standpoint, the, the assets that we have aren't going anywhere, but the relationships that we've been able to cultivate through this are deep and precious. Um, I had the good fortune of knowing everyone on screen um, before this project started, and it's just brought everyone closer. But um, I think for the future, these are guideposts towards other wonderful digital exhibitions that could happen if we have the resources and the wherewithal to do it. And all of that is based on the faculty's brain trust, the incredible research that they do. And we were so fortunate that the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation came through with support to help us support their work and make it more readily accessible. I don't know if Franny has things that she would want to say from the library standpoint. You know, I think um, first that was really important was to provide time um, time for time for you to do your research and I'm sure more time would have been even better. Um, and then I think the other piece from the library's perspective uh, was was the time from our, um, our postdoctoral fellows um, to, to help with these projects um, because that that's just it, it, it's a huge undertaking and, and as I as I spoke about in my presentation um, that the, you know it, it really does take uh, time from every person uh, who worked on these projects. And, and so, um, yeah, it really does, really does take a village there. And so I think also ensuring, you know, to, to have successful projects um, that there is time dedicated from every single person uh, who's going to work uh, on a project like this is absolutely vital to its success uh, to make sure that that's set aside um, from, from their position um, is really helpful. I, I think there, there are points, I mean, for me, this project was a wonderful experience because I could work with both institutions and the Digital Scholars Center, which really um, brought the digital humanities at the University of Oregon up to snuff. And uh, now we have to make clear uh, to people who are interested in such projects that there is the necessity to have support from the institutions who have collections like the library like the museum but also it is really necessary for our administrators to understand that digital humanities is not going away 
and that it is worth supporting because you cannot on one hand sort of make the library transition from a location in which books and journals and newspapers are stored and then tell them to get rid of these materials and switch to digital and at the same time not support digital projects. And so very often they don't understand what this entails. Not the, the people in the library or in the museum, but the people who are in different locations in the university and may decide about the future. And they also need to understand that maintaining these sites takes effort and support, but it also doesn't just take effort and support. They should also recognize that these projects really give visibility to not only our individual work, but give visibility to the institutions because the projects really make visible what uh, precious collections we have, all of these jewels that are sort of hidden in the, the behind the walls of the museum and the library and can be accessed now really worldwide mm -hmm. because people can see yokai from <laughs> Glenn's collection and calligraphy from Akiko's collection and we'll see beautiful textiles and the idea what is behind textiles in the sense that they are of course for the longest time seen as crafts in the west where it's the art in the east so yeah. long story short it uh, is necessary to have sort of a push in consciousness about what digital work actually means and that's what we want to do <laughs> push a little it's, it's absolutely an investment. And I talked a little bit earlier about what it takes to sustain a digital project. And mm -hmm. one of the other things that we can do is we can demonstrate impact in a variety of ways, both through use in curriculum, which I think Glenn can talk about a little bit as everyone can here. Um, and also through things like analytics that we have installed um, on all of our sites, I can tell you uh, that we have tens of thousands of hits from all around the world. Uh, I mean, just truly impressive from day one of launch. Um, and not just, um, I know I, I had an email from someone who was like, it's just me visiting the site, right? I'm like, no, it is not just you visiting the site. <laughs> These are tens of thousands of hits. And so these are being used widely at other institutions in classes, um, incorporated into curricula. Um, as Ina said, that these are really kind of gems and you know, kind of the, the goal of uniting our collections and highlighting our collections. You know, there is kind of this perspective of, you know, like, oh, we've surfaced these gems, you know, hidden in the museum, hidden in the archives. And you know that this is really um, a, a really exciting way of making them visible. I'd like to sort of second that and second something Akiko said earlier that you know even though we're thinking in terms of digital humanities in an important way, you know we not only don't want to lose sight of the object, but it is about the object, right? Where you know I'm thinking of a, I guess one of the earliest digital humanities things that I made use of in the classroom from elsewhere, which is Tom Conlon's. Uh, website with the scrolls of the Mongol invasions. Up until that point, I might have known of them just as text, right? But because of that digital humanities thing, I was able to make students aware of them as things. And I've never seen the actual things, but bringing the thingness of them into the classroom through the digital realm. And I think that's what we're all hoping to do, right? Maybe people will actually visit and, and handle these textiles. But if not, even if they don't, they're at the very least thinking about what makes them textile and the textileness of them, as opposed to just talking about the motif or talking about the colors. Yeah, so um, for me, uh, you know, I, I'm coming from the, the, the field of art history and um, I, I feel that perhaps um, quite a few of us who are doing art history, um, we may be very familiar with museums and you know, I work with Rose and I work with Children's Museum of Art, 
all the time. And I know everybody there. And I do use um, the special collections, but not as much. And the privilege of this project was that I got to know more of the people and the teams within the library. Um, and it's very important, particularly for art history, because the digital component is the is now and also is going to be the future. And our graduate students are now working on digital projects. And you know, uh, and Rose and I were in another sort of group thinking about the future of the museum and the ability to do creative digital humanities project will become almost like a, a, not just a selling point, but a requirement for to be eligible for a curatorial position. And also at the same time, there are uh, people who are coming out of art history programs who are finding positions in special collections. So the library and the museum's institutions are coming you know, uh, closer and closer. So in a way, this sort of collaborative project will encourage future scholars and students now to think of these two institutions as being something that is you know, a whole and, you know, closely related. And that sh cannot be bad. And I think that will help students in the future. I'd just like to shout out really quickly, another one of our amazing Mellon projects, which is United Collections, uh, unitedcollections.uoregon.edu, which is specifically talking about kind of the similar similarities and differences between uh, museums and libraries and the ways that they work with collections and also kind of how they've been kind of growing more similar over time and then also where those differences persist. Um, it's a fabulous resource also includes a number of open educational um, kind of resources that can be incorporated into courses as well and specifically talks about uh, digitization and some of these issues that we've been addressing today about uh, negotiating between the physical object and the digital one. Well, I think this has been great and thank all of the panelists for all of their scholarship and hard work on the sites. Thanks to the teams who made them possible. Thanks to the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation for providing the support to make it happen. And uh, we look forward to many future collaborative projects at the University of Oregon and beyond. Thank you. Thank you to Ann you. Rose, our very able moderator today. <laughs> And thank you everybody for coming. Thank you. <laughs> All right.